I've been inspired by the best-selling memoir uh, of our time, uh, Sarah Palin's Going Rogue. Uh, so I want to announce I'm make, writing my own memoir. Uh, I've tentatively entitled it uh, Going Rogaine. Uh, my alternate title is uh, Going Several Times a Night. So. I'm actually very good with book titles. I uh, uh, suggested to uh, Dick Cheney uh, when his book was being done that he call it the Angina Monologues. But uh, <laughs> as with many things, uh, he doesn't take my advice. Uh, uh, just uh, also to uh, bring you up to date a little bit uh, on the news, of course, uh, there's an awful lot uh, happening out there. Uh, we are already focused on the 2012 campaign. Uh, the two front runners for the Republican nomination uh, very clearly are ex-governors Mitt Romney and Sarah Palin. Uh, one, of course, obsessed with hair and clothes and looks, and the other's from Alaska. Uh, uh, And, of course, we have scandal everywhere, not just in politics. Uh, Tiger Woods just uh, gave another interview, uh, but uh, many in politics, and uh, among them John Edwards, uh, who now, of course, has admitted that uh, he is the father of the love child and said that he is so ashamed of himself that he can't even look at himself in the mirror anymore. Uh, on the bright side, that frees up about four hours a day for him to do <laughs> other more, more productive things. And of course, we're here uh, after a momentous uh, day yesterday, which uh, we have talked about some and I'll talk about uh, a little bit more, but I'm now uh, uh, looking forward to what may be the most interesting thing uh, to emerge from the health care vote. Rush Limbaugh a few weeks ago announced that if Congress passed this health care bill, he is going to leave the country and move to Costa Rica. Uh, That led a lot of Democrats to say, why didn't we do this years ago? Uh, but I'm uh, especially interested in what happens when he lands at the airport in Costa Rica and discovers that they have a single-payer, government-provided health care system. Uh, fortunately, uh, because they pay for all the medications, uh, the heart palpitations uh, will get taken care of when he's uh, there. Of course, as we discuss this subject, it couldn't be more timely. As yesterday, uh, one of the Democrats walking into the Capitol uh, to uh, begin the debate was spat upon by a protester. Uh, another, John Lewis, had uh, racial epithets, including the N-word, uh, hurled at him. And then, of course, on the floor last night, as uh, Bart Stupak of Michigan got up to oppose uh, the Republican motion to recommit, uh, one of his colleagues yelled out, baby killer. Uh, on the House floor. Uh, so can't we all just get along? I think we have an answer to that question uh, right here and now. It is important to put that into some historical perspective, as uh, John Bond did. We have yet to have, as we did 150 years ago, a member of the House wander over to the Senate chamber and cane one of its members on the floor uh, to within an inch of his life. So uh, we haven't yet uh, descended to that level of violence, uh, but the day is young. Uh, and uh, we're clearly moving in uh, a, an unfortunate direction. Um, now, let me just step back for a minute and talk a little bit about some of the broader dynamics that we have in our politics right now and some of the uh, tensions. The 2006 and 2008 elections were about as clear an expression of a public desire for change uh, and a mandate for change as we've had in our lifetimes. I think the only election that comes close uh, is 1980 when uh, we had a very clear expression with the sweeping landslide for Ronald Reagan, uh, bringing in a Republican Senate at that point for the first time in a quarter century and with very, very big gains in the House of Representatives. In this case, we had two elections in a row, 2006, where Democrats picked up uh, 30 seats in the House, nearly double-digit gains in the Senate, and recaptured their majorities. And then following that with 2008, with a sweeping landslide for Barack Obama, and more big gains uh, in the uh, House uh, and the Senate. 
Uh, the desire for change that had been building for some time clearly had its roots in part in public unhappiness over two wars, uh, some of which we had expressed yet again uh, this morning, uh, in a faltering economy that was uh, doing uh, much more than faltering, cratering by the time of the 2008 elections, but also in a growing anger and unhappiness with Washington and a sense that uh, while we had pressing problems for most of us in our everyday lives, uh, for the country uh, at home and abroad in a larger sense, the people we elected to Washington uh, to solve those problems were more content with getting into their proverbial sandboxes and throwing mud pies uh, at the other side. And they took that anger out on the party that had all the reins of power, the Republicans with those two elections. Uh, so we have this mandate for change but it was fairly clear to those of us who have been immersed in Washington politics for a long time that it would soon come up against the continuing and deepening dysfunction. And we continue to grapple with the question of whether that desire for change and the dysfunction of our politics can interact together, can they get along, and also recognizing that uh, the desire for change can turn very quickly on the agent of uh, change, uh, some of which we have seen uh, as well. The dysfunction uh, does not disappear with one election or two elections or one charismatic president uh, and of course there are a lot of reasons for it that I'll get to uh, in a few minutes at least to uh, offer some observations. Mixed in with that was a, a, another element of all of this which is an understanding or realization that at a time when uh, we have a, a difficult uh, economy Almost always in America, we see the rise of populism. It's a part of our political DNA. And a populism brings with it some uh, unsettling uh, elements, usually a fairly heavy dose of uh, isolationism, of protectionism, of nativism. Uh, but as much as anything, it's an anger at people in power and a distrust of what they're doing and a search for scapegoats. It wasn't very difficult this time to find scapegoats. It's not like, where's Waldo? Uh, you could start with the PR geniuses who suggested to the CEOs of the big three automobile companies, why don't you each take a private jet to Washington to beg for $16 billion of taxpayer money? Uh, and then we segued to the uh, AIG bonuses and the other bonuses for bankers and uh, fat cats. Uh, to uh, the Goldman Sachs executives who figured out a way to muscle aside pregnant women and uh, school children so that they could get their H1N1 uh, vaccine a little bit early. Uh, and uh, on now to insurance companies, but at the top of the list is politicians and uh, those people in power who helped to engineer the bailouts uh, of the automobile industry uh, and the banks who are doing just fine themselves, uh, even uh, as the rest of us uh, are struggling. And you put those things together, a larger dysfunction with a populist anger, and it leads us to a current point where there is a significant danger that the basic legitimacy of the system and the people operating in the system uh, comes uh, into question, and the temptation for people in power is to turn the spotlight on others as the scapegoats uh, and to exploit in a demagogic fashion uh, the un anger and unhappiness uh, that uh, people uh, have. Uh, put all of that together with a very ambitious agenda and continuing and uh, in some ways uh, uh, deepening uh, economic issues, uh, especially if we look at some of the long-term problems, and it creates a special set of challenges. And let me say those challenges are always there and when you have government acting uh, in major ways, there's always a challenge because what, in effect, our uh, elected political figures and policymakers are telling people out there is, trust us. This is going to hurt in the short run, but it's for a longer term gain. Now, that's always a difficult sell. Uh, human nature is such that we don't like to take short term pain for the if come maybe of long term gain. But if there's a very high level of distrust of the people making those decisions, and if the decisions can't be made with the cover of broad bipartisan leadership support, and instead what you have is the leaders on one side trying to undermine the legitimacy of those on the other who are making the changes and saying trust us, it makes it very difficult to set policy and to act in a fashion where you actually can 
begin to work on problems uh, that require uh, a lot of time and something to deal with the long term. And I thought about that uh, over the last few weeks in an area that Bill Frenzel talked about and, and that is most near and dear to his hearts, that in this era of hyperpartisanship, uh, we've seen the minority party in its deep desire to deep six the health care plan, take a couple of actions uh, collectively or at the leadership level that are uh, nothing short of bizarre. Uh, one was the chairman of the Republican Party, Michael Steele, and many of his colleagues in congressional leadership signing on to something they called the Medicare Bill of Rights, which in effect said we pledge to protect every dollar in Medicare into perpetuity. Uh, if you are going to solve the long-term fiscal disaster that we face uh, with uh, the mismatch between revenues and outlays, uh, being staggering looking ahead 5, 10, or 15 years. You have to reduce the rate of growth of the big entitlement programs, which starts with the health care ones in Medicare and Medicaid. And if you take a position for expedient purposes that you're going to protect all of Medicare, then when you have to turn around and make changes, you've lost a lot of your own legitimacy and it makes it more difficult to do. The second and even more bizarre was when we had a vote in the Senate on a commission that was the brainchild of a bipartisan action or actors. Uh, Kent Conrad, the Democratic senator from North Dakota, uh, and uh, a Republican senator, Judd Gregg, from New Hampshire, uh, a commission that was the equivalent of a base closing commission that would uh, require uh, broad bipartisan support, 18 members with 14 needed to come up with a plan that would inevitably be a tough plan to deal with our long-term deficit explosion. Uh, and that would, as the Base Closing Commission does, demand an up or down vote on uh, the product uh, of the commission. Now, you hate to move to commissions uh, because it itself undermines the representative system that our framers created. These are tough decisions that ought to be made by Congress. But under the current circumstances, and given the larger question and some of what Bill talked about, we love to have government at a discount. We love to get the government that we all demand and pay less taxes than it actually costs. So you're telling people things that they don't want to hear. But at least forcing an up or down vote whether you are actually, when the rubber uh, hits the road, going to be fiscally responsible or not, uh, it was probably the best idea we had on the table. And in the end, when it came up for a vote in the Senate, seven Republicans who were co-sponsors of the commission voted against their own bill so that they could deny Obama a victory and in some ways so that they wouldn't have to make some of those tough decisions, but it was done in a rather strange fashion that moves us further away from an ability to confront larger problems. So we're not just talking about a process here that is unseemly and difficult. We're playing with live ammunition uh, when it comes to dealing with problems and issues that uh, are going to affect us all and that are especially going to affect the young people in the audience and around the country because, in effect, uh, we are uh, uh, buying on credit uh, and the bills will come due uh, when you are ready to pay uh, those taxes and to deal with them. Now, uh, I've been in Washington for uh, just over 40 years, and I will say that uh, uh, my uh, basic reaction at this point is that this is the worst I've seen it in the 40 years that I've been immersed in our politics uh, in the halls of Congress and uh, uh, up and down Pennsylvania Avenue. It's always uh, difficult to uh, make that kind of judgment without stepping back a little bit from it. Uh, Dana Carvey had a character on Saturday Night Live, an old man who used to talk about in my day, uh, and uh, you always want to exaggerate a little bit, but I think it's true. When I first came to Washington, uh, it was in the fall of 1969, and I was working on the Hill, uh, uh, and uh, I was sharing a townhouse up near DuPont Circle uh, with a couple of friends, 
And the second night I was there, one of my uh, roommates had a dog, and it was a balmy fall evening, and uh, I said, I'll take the dog out for a walk. We started to walk up towards DuPont Circle, and the dog started to yelp uncontrollably. I looked around, didn't see anything. We kept walking. He stopped and was uh, uh, not at all happy. And then I realized why. His senses being more acute than mine, uh, a tear gas canister was rolling down the street towards us, uh, followed by several others, followed by a large crowd of people moving very rapidly, and behind them, police in full riot gear. There had been a demonstration at the South Vietnamese Embassy uh, across DuPont Circle. Uh, the dog and I, uh, coughing and choking, made our way back to the house, uh, took some wet towels and put them under the door frames, and we waited out what was a pretty tough demonstration. Uh, the Vietnam War created all kinds of schisms and conflicts in Washington, and it got awfully tough. And I remember vividly in the first year that I was there being in the Senate chamber when George McGovern took to the floor of the Senate and reflecting on his own institution's culpability in the Vietnam War said, the walls of this chamber reek with blood. Uh, that caused a collective gasp. You don't talk like that uh, inside Congress. Uh, and just a short while later, Bob Dole, uh, who was then uh, basically auditioning for the role of uh, chairman of the Republican National Committee that he took to his regret a little bit later on, uh, went on the floor to uh, take on McGovern and just rip the bark off of him. And I thought, boy, it couldn't get tougher than this. And yet, uh, before that year was out, I witnessed Bob Dole and George McGovern walking arm in arm uh, in the corridors of the Capitol because they had forged a relationship, a lifelong friendship as it turned out, based on their common interest in dealing with problems of hunger uh, in America. And I realized as I went through that year that Vietnam, this searing, difficult issue, was not a partisan issue. It actually cut very much across party lines. Among the strongest supporters of President Nixon's uh, approach to the war in Vietnam were the Democrats who chaired almost all of the major committees and subcommittees, Southern conservative Democrats. And among the strongest opponents of the Vietnam War were a group of moderate and liberal Democrats. We used to call the uh, Republicans, excuse me. We used to call those Democrats back then, now we call them blue dogs, but back then we called them bull weevils. And the term we had for moderate and liberal Republicans was gypsy moths, for the uh, bug uh, that infests uh, uh, foliage in the north. And among them, uh, people like Mark Hatfield, the senator from Oregon, and Charlie Goodell, the senator from uh, New York, and uh, Jack Javits, a senator from New York, uh, were as significant in the anti-war movement as Democrats like McGovern. Uh, so it was different back then. And back then it was different in another way. We used to have uh, a, a rhythm to our politics. We'd have very tough campaigns. And of course, when I came in, we were just past the 1968 campaign uh, where Richard Nixon won in a three-way race with uh, Hubert Humphrey and uh, George McGovern. And it was a very, very tough uh, and uh, divisive election. But when it was over, the campaign was over, we moved to what we viewed as a season of governing. You put some of that campaign aside uh, and uh, you worked on governing. And there's a difference because governing is usually an additive process. You're trying to pull people together and pull them in to find a coalition that can make things work. Politics and campaigns, that's like a war. You don't want to add people, uh, you, you want to vanquish somebody. The other side when you are dealing with governing is an adversary. And an adversary one day can become an ally the next so you don't go too far to alienate them. But in politics, it's the enemy. You want to kill the enemy. We use a lot of the terms that come from war in that fashion. And we'd have these very distinct seasons. Uh, now that's all gone. We have the permanent campaign. And it's all politics uh, all the time. One of the reasons, uh, there are many reasons for it, and many reasons for the changes. 
One is that uh, when I first arrived in Washington, we were already in the middle of a pretty dramatic regional realignment of our politics. Democrats kept their majorities in Congress. They were 15 years into what would be 40 consecutive years of majority in the House uh, and 15 years into uh, what had another decade to go of majority in the Senate, built on having a solid Democratic South that was largely conservative, uh, that added to their strength elsewhere in the country, uh, outside the South, that tended to be more liberal. But that coalition worked in terms of being able to win and keep majorities. And everybody was satisfied because they kept a majority and the conservatives had a lot of the power positions to go along with it. The Republican Party had, I would say, up to a third of its members who were the moderates and liberals, mostly from New England and the Northeast and with a solid base on the West Coast. Well, starting with the Voting Rights Act, when Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act in 1965, he turned to his then aide, Harry McPherson, and said, this is going to cost us, the Democratic Party, the South for a generation or more. And it did begin a process where the South became competitive and then eventually dominated by Republicans. We may be seeing at least a little bit of a change uh, in a different direction now, but uh, it created a very different dynamic where now the South, which was a trace element in the Republican Party back in the 1960s, is the largest component of uh, its uh, membership in Congress now. And at the same time, the Northeast and the West Coast began to change. The West Coast, Washington, Oregon, California, are bastions of the Democratic Party now. And in New England, there is not a single Republican represented in the House of Representatives, uh, three now uh, in the Senate. Uh, and as the parties changed regionally, the Democrats became more homogeneous and moved left. The Republicans became more homogeneous and moved right. And then, of course, as we moved along, we had another seminal event, which was after 40 consecutive years of majority, the Republicans, led by Newt Gingrich, out of the desert and into the promised land, recaptured the majority in 1994, even as Republicans, after having been out for six years, recaptured the Senate again. Uh, while they held it for a dozen years, held both houses, we moved from an era where there was absolutely no question about which party was going to be in the majority. Through most of the time that Bill Frenzel served and had an impact on policy in Congress, every election going in, it was pretty clear, even if the numbers shifted, that Democrats were going to stay in the majority. And the two parties accommodated those realities. The minority party for much of that time, until it got more and more frustrated, understood, as Bill said, that we're not going to win a lot of these battles, but we can fight the good fight and we're going to be able to have some impact on policy. And it worked because with the two parties having many of its members near the middle and with conservative Democrats tending to dominate the power positions, they were often closer ideologically to their Republican counterparts on the committee than to some of their more junior Democrats. We had what we called a conservative coalition. Now that was beginning to fray as the parties changed in the 80s and into the 90s. And as we saw what is inevitable, party is in the majority for 40 consecutive years. They get arrogant uh, and condescending uh, and complacent. You think it's uh, uh, part of the natural order. And a minority party gets more and more frustrated uh, even if they're getting a few things uh, they're being condescended to. So the tensions were growing. And then the floodgates broke in 1994. That has led us into a very different era. And it is an era in which in every election, you can easily imagine circumstances where the majority can shift, or at least where the election could lead you close enough that you'd be within striking distance. Now combine those things together. Parties becoming more homogeneous and moving more towards the polls the collapse of the center, a coalition politics that becomes more unlikely, the rise of a permanent campaign, which means no more a season of governing and campaigning, but all politics. And that means that the people who are in the inner councils when politicians are looking at policy 
are not the policy types, but the pollsters and the political consultants. The focus, as Larry LaRocco said, on fundraising and the need to raise that money and the high stakes that come, even higher stakes, when you know the majority can shift. And if the majority shifts, you're no longer going to be going from here to here, but from here to here in agenda setting and very possibly uh, outcomes. And if you are a member of Congress, you're thinking every decision that I make could have an impact on whether I'm in the majority or in the minority. And so a decision that you might make to work with somebody on the other side, even if it's good policy and even if you have a role, maybe you are taking away a wedge issue that you could use against the other side. Maybe you're giving the other side traction that they wouldn't otherwise get. And so the phenomenon of sleeping with the enemy becomes heightened. And it drives those people who are there to try and work together to make good policy further from being able to do so. Now, it's different and harsher now. But let me also say that you could imagine Barack Obama after that sweeping election victory on January 20th, 2009, standing at the podium like this on the uh, Capitol uh, 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 porch, looking out over that never-ending sea of people uh, who were there uh, to watch his inaugural address and thinking, boy, it couldn't get any better than this. Here I am with a landslide victory. I've got a 70% approval rating. I've come in with about uh, 258 members of my own party out of 435 in the House of Representatives. Uh, I've got 57, soon to be 58 members of the Senate. If you told him at that point that he would soon have 60, he would have been perhaps even more ecstatic. And everything's just going to be dandy here. But at some point, probably out of the corner of his eye, he noticed Bill Clinton sitting there and perhaps remembered that when Bill Clinton had been standing in the same spot 16 years earlier, he was coming into a political environment with an almost eerily, almost identical number of his own party members in Congress. 258 in the House, 56, uh, uh, 57 actually, uh, soon to be 56 in the Senate, and of course suffered from a miserable first two years despite having that large number of party members. The Republicans had lost the White House for the first time in 12 years, still out of power in the Congress, 38 straight years in the House, and the attitude of the minority was, all right, you want it all, you're on your own. Don't count on a single vote from us. And with a difficult economy, he came forward with an economic, uh, uh, fiscally uh, uh, responsible, he thought, disciplined plan, and did not get a single Republican to support it in either the House or the Senate. Couldn't keep his own Democrats together, but it took him eight months of humiliating, pleading with his own party to finally achieve that outcome. Eight months in, in August of uh, uh, 1993, he finally got over the top by one vote in each House. Instead of having an early big victory that he could use as a springboard to something more, it looked more like a humiliating defeat. And then, of course, it went on to uh, the partisan conflict over health care and the flame out of his health care bill. And then that 1994 election that brought the Republicans into power. And here we were 16 years later, and in a set of conditions that should have been much, much better. Bill Clinton had won in a three-way race at a time of great populist anger with 43.5% of the popular votes. Uh, he had not had coattails bringing in large numbers of his own party members. They actually lost a few seats in both houses. It was a difficult economic time, but not the worst economic time. And here was Barack Obama, big landslide, big coattails, worst economy since the Great Depression, teetering at the abyss of inflation and uh, of deflation and depression. None of the scandals that crippled Clinton right at the beginning, stumbling uh, over those things and over the gays in the military issue, 
And Obama, with a 70% approval rating, three weeks into his presidency, it's deja vu all over again. Stimulus package is his first big priority to get us out of an economic ditch, not a single Republican vote in the House of Representatives. And the big change from 16 years earlier, three Republican votes in the Senate, which was just enough to overcome a filibuster to make that bill uh, happen. But it was a signal that uh, things are getting no better and indeed, given the conditions, are getting worse. And now we clearly uh, face an even bigger set of problems with Obama, though, having one significant change, which is that he brought greater discipline with his own party. Perhaps members who realized what had happened to them when they weren't able to keep their act together enough to prevail in 1994. And unlike Bill Clinton, uh, won his uh, uh, economic package early on and now has prevailed with a health care plan that Clinton wanted to make his signature in his first two years and couldn't do. But as we see, it's come at a great price in terms of division in the country and rancor uh, and continuing rancor in our politics. I want to say just a couple more things uh, before I end and we have some uh, give and uh, take. One is that for the first time, even though I have some larger historical perspective, and I understand, as John pointed out, that we've had greater times of conflict in the past, even though, as I said earlier, we've had times when we had violence. You look at some of the language that's being used now, and it still doesn't compare with some of what was said about Abraham Lincoln or about Grover Cleveland or about other presidents uh, in the past. But it's a different era. It's an era with cable television and talk radio and a kind of mobilization that we didn't see before. We have a much larger government, a much more complex economy, and the kinds of divisions that occur leave me a little frightened now about where we might go. I can imagine, unfortunately, a set of circumstances now where we could have a second significant uh, economic uh, dip, the double dip, as we say. The greatest likelihood is it would come with problems in the commercial real estate market, where we had a bubble that has not yet quite burst. And then with the potential collapse of community banks around the country that are most heavily invested there. And I can imagine every major financial figure in the country from across the board coming to Washington and saying, we've got to bail out these banks to prevent another economic catastrophe, and having large numbers of members of Congress say, forget about it. We're not doing that. Who are you to tell us what to do? At the same time, we're at a point with partisan divisions where it's bled over into national security affairs, where if we had another 9-11 type attack tomorrow, unlike 2001 when 535 members of Congress gathered on the steps of the Capitol to sing America the Beautiful, to show the rest of the world and our adversaries the solidarity, uh, solidarity that we have, I fear that if we had such an attack tomorrow, uh, we might maybe get 300 members on the steps of the Capitol. 200 would be busy back in their offices writing impeachment resolutions. We do not have the kind of unity that even in a crisis will necessarily bring us together. And the division that's causing the collapse of the middle is likely to continue in November uh, to be exacerbated rather than ameliorated. The remaining moderates in both parties who are caught in the middle of this crossfire, ideological and partisan, are either, in many cases, retiring or are the ones who are the most vulnerable in an election. And so we're going to lose the remaining uh, moderate Republicans in the House, uh, Mike Castle uh, of Delaware, for example, uh, uh, moving over to run for the Senate, and the Blue Dog Democrats, uh, who are uh, significant in number and have provided a kind of center, uh, a requirement that Democrats accommodate them even as they move towards a partisan uh, victory, at least it has some ideological uh, centrist leavening, are among the most vulnerable there. 
So we're going to see a Democratic Party that will be reduced in number but become even more ideologically pure, and a Republican Party that's going to tilt more towards a kind of Tea Party populist activism, making those divisions even greater and making the possibility of bipartisan cooperation and of that bipartisan leadership consensus that is almost always required if you're going to make people accept short-term pain for long-term gain uh, even more uh, elusive. Now, what do we do about this? Some of this is deeply enough rooted in our culture that it's going to be very difficult to change. Cable news and talk radio thrive on conflict uh, and uh, love the notion of people at one side screaming at people on the other. And when you have a world with 500 television stations and an unlimited number of uh, internet outlets, cutting through the cacophony does require often something very extreme. Ann Coulter learned as she went from one bestseller to another that the wilder the charges you make, the more you're able to sell books, and we find that on both sides. Uh, the New York Times, I should say, uh, a couple of weeks ago, had a profile of Roger Ailes, the brilliant businessman, former political consultant who runs Fox News. Fox News made a net profit of $700 million last year, making it the crown jewel in the Murdoch empire. And that $700 million is more than all three network news divisions, plus CNN and MSNBC and CNBC made combined. Now, he's found a business model that is extraordinarily successful. That business model isn't going to work if Fox News is saying, look at that, bipartisan cooperation, isn't it wonderful? It thrives on finding a base of people who are angry and want to hear the message over and over again. And MSNBC, of course, is trying very much to do the mirror opposite model uh, on the left. So there's very little room for communication in the middle. At the same time, we have a redistricting process and a larger primary process that means that candidates and members of Congress who try and find a way to move to the middle are the most vulnerable to those primary challenges. Redistricting is a significant part of it, but it's not all of it. The Senate doesn't have districts. Arlen Specter, who John Bond mentioned, switched parties in Pennsylvania because he looked out there and saw that it was going to be impossible for him to win a Republican primary. Right now, strong conservatives like Charles Grassley of Iowa, Bob Bennett of Utah, and John McCain in Arizona are facing serious challenges in primaries from the right. We have electoral magnets that are pulling candidates further away, and some of the Democrats who voted against the health care bill, uh, Labor and uh, MoveOn.org have uh, basically uh, pledged that they will put up primary challenges to take them on as well. So there isn't a lot that you can do to erase this set of uh, problems, and frankly, when you have campaigns that are so combative, getting the right kind of people to run for office now when they know that the campaign will not only be expensive, but will be designed to try and strip away their dignity and the reputations that they've built up over a lifetime. And then you move to the kind of lifestyle that members of Congress have, and it's getting harder and harder to find those kinds of people. And yet there are some things that would make a difference in my judgment. The single most significant, but one that has very little chance of success, I believe, would be mandatory attendance at the polls. Australia has a system where if you do not show up at the voting booth, you have to pay a fine of about $15. Now, you don't have to vote. You can vote for none of the above. And it's not such a huge deal, a $15 fine. But over time, this has been going on for several decades, Australians have decided that they'd rather show up and it's become a kind of civic responsibility. And their uh, turnout is about 96 or 97 percent. Now, what difference does it make, you say, you know, just because people vote? Here's the real difference. Our politics now are driven by a desire and an attempt 
to get your own base turning out and to keep the other base from turning out. And that changes the dialogue. It forces us towards the extremes. If you know, and Australian politicians of all stripes will tell us, if you know that your base is going to be there and the other side's base is going to be there, you're going to aim your appeals at voters in the middle. And what it does is it changes the issues that are discussed. You aren't discussing same-sex marriage, abortion, guns, or the wedge issues designed to excite one base or the other. You end up talking about deficits and long-term debt. And you don't use inflammatory language that turns off voters in the middle. Instead, you focus on something else. So if there's one thing, and that includes primaries, where now, of course, it's the small, slender group of activists who dominate that tend to pull us to the left and the right. If you could get everybody voting, you're going to change the dialogue, change the issues, and that ultimately is going to change the kinds of people that we get running and winning. Now, the second thing that I would do relates to something that both Bill and uh, Larry said when they were up here. Uh, Bill Frenzel has been a champion of this for many years, and for many years he would meet with the freshman classes of members coming in with his wife, Ruthie, and would tell them as a piece of advice, as a veteran, move your families to Washington. This is going to be the most exciting experience of your lives, and you should share it with uh, your family. And it's going to make for a better life, and it makes for a better institution. That appeal stopped working effectively uh, in the 1990s. Now, it wasn't just that, uh, as Larry LaRocco said, Newt Gingrich uh, said, don't poison yourself by coming to Washington. It's also very difficult for people with families uh, because Washington is an extremely expensive place. And if you've got to keep a home in your own district and get something in Washington, and it sounds like a lot of money that members of Congress make, but it's basically the same as second-year associates in law firms. That's who you're competing with for housing. And you want to be relatively close to the capital with good schools. It's out of reach for people who don't have a lot of capital. But as much as that, really was the sense that affected members as much as it did people around the country, what a poisonous place to be, I don't want to infect my family with it. And the demands of fundraising and of modern political life are such that people wanted to go back home every weekend and that was an expectation raised for uh, constituents. So the second thing that I would do is to move to a different congressional schedule. Three weeks in Washington, starting at nine on Monday morning and ending at 5 on Friday afternoon. A revolutionary concept. And then one week off where you could go back home and meet with constituents. When you are there five days a week, you're going to have to interact more. And you're going to move your families. And you're going to be on the sidelines of the soccer games with people. And you are, as Larry said, much less prone to call somebody a baby killer or uh, a fascist uh, if you know them and you know their family members. Now, I'd combine that with two other things. One, no fundraising during those 15 days of the month. Because now members are running off the uh, campus uh, at the Capitol to make fundraising calls every spare minute. And that itself not only moves us away from a deliberative process, but moves us more into a campaign mode. And then a generous housing allowance so that people could actually afford two houses. Now again, the chances of this happening are, to use George Bush's favorite phrase, slim to none and slim just left the building. But if we could do a couple of simple things, we might begin to inch us back towards at least some dialogue. Nothing wrong with partisanship, it's built into a, de a democracy, it's a necessary component. But we've got to move back to where we see the other side as adversaries and not as the enemy or the ability to maintain some fabric of governance where we can actually solve these problems that are real and that will affect you in your everyday lives is actually achievable. I'm going to start off with a question for you from the, from the chair here. Um, how far do you see this, how far have we gone? Uh, have we gone to a point that is fundamentally going to change the system that may be unrecoverable? And if we have, what do you see the next evolution being. I mean, we're, we're within the bounds of a system that's worked off and on for, you know, a couple hundred years. What, what would come next if this has gone too far? 
Uh, I don't think we're, we've gone too far yet. And let me say that, you know, part of the, the uh, dysfunction here is that we are being driven by, I suspect, what amounts to no more than 20 or 30 percent of the population, uh, which are the people who, are, who themselves are at either end. Uh, most Americans remain somewhere in the middle. We are a centrist country, probably a little more center-right than center-left, but we're a centrist country. Uh, we just aren't having centrist governance at this point. And frankly, the other part of the frustration for me is that the solutions to many of these problems are not left or right. Many of them are pragmatic solutions. I've actually been frustrated in the health care debate because if you really look at the substance of this bill, it is a uh, moderate Republican alternative. There's no public option. Uh, there's no government control of the system. It's run through private insurers. It maintains the basic structure. It's a combination of Mitt Romney's Massachusetts plan and the alternative offered by Dave Dernberger, John Chafee, uh, Chuck Grassley, Bob Dole in 1993 to the Clinton plan. Uh, so it should have some broad bipartisan support. What Lindsey Graham is working out on climate change with Joe Lieberman and uh, uh, John Kerry, what he's doing with Chuck Schumer on immigration, uh, what we're seeing with Bob Corker, Republican from Tennessee, and Chris Dodd on financial regulation, uh, is looking for pragmatic ways to deal with problems. Uh, so it's not a bridge too far. Uh, but as I say, in the short run, there is a real danger that we will move further away from real solutions and poison the well for more people. And it's going to require a different level of leadership. And let me say that's another part of the problem. Although leadership requires followership, uh, we don't have a Lyndon Johnson or a, an Everett Dirksen uh, as the leaders in the Senate anymore. People who would get together when transcendent issues came up and find a way to work together. Bill McCulloch was a Republican congressman from Ohio who stepped up to the plate in the 1960s and provided the crucial support to get the Civil Rights Bill of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 over the line. It was a very tough thing for him to do. He did it because he knew it was right for the country, and he ended up working with uh, Lyndon Johnson to make it happen, uh, taking some flack from his own party and from Democrats who didn't want to see that happen. Dirksen did the same thing. Uh, we don't have those leaders anymore, but it's not to say we can't get those leaders. Uh, between permanent campaigning, fundraising, and the collapse of the moderates, has a career in politics become more about keeping your job in office rather than representing the people? Uh, I do think, actually, You know, I, I sometimes wonder uh, how we get even the people that we do to come, given uh, all of those phenomena. I travel around a lot, and I'll get on an airplane, and I'll see a member of Congress who has to, who's going on a plane every weekend uh, and going to a place where it's a hub where they have to catch a puddle jumper to a second stop and then drive 100 miles and do that twice a week. Every day. Uh, they're running off to make hundreds of phone calls, pretty humiliating phone calls, to beg for money. Uh, and then you're in this environment, uh, why even do it? And for a lot of people who get into it, I think it does become this driving desire to stay, because that's what you're doing, and because it has some obvious other appeals, and it can take you away from that larger purpose. Uh, take a look at the book that Lou Fry put together. Uh, uh, with his colleague here uh, and look at the rules of politics that some of these uh, terrific people who've served in both houses have come up with and you see repeated over and over again the notion that you've got to be true to yourself. Why are you there? Uh, if you're there either to vote no or just to position to win or lose, it, it doesn't have much appeal. And I think it is changing uh, the, the nature of people who come and what they do. Uh, I'm not against people serving for a long time in Congress. In fact, when we did have a, an era where a lot of people did, they became more invested in long-term solutions because they were going to be a part of an institution and in making an institution operate. Now I'm afraid we get people who come in because it's an exciting uh, ego trip to be in Congress or because they're on an ideological crusade 
or because they're going to use it as a springboard to something else, and they don't care about their own institution. And that's a problem as well. Uh, and part of what we have to do is get back, actually, to understanding that what we want in politics is politicians. Politicians, by definition, work to compromise, to find solutions. Instead, the siren song out there is somebody who stands up and says, I'm not a politician. And it's those people who don't understand the need to find solutions across lines, to be pragmatic, who are as much a part of the problem as a part of the solution. So since we're on the subject of bipartisanship, we'll take one from the other side of the aisle. Um, whoa. Uh, maybe uh, with the opinions not being considered uh, because they're not extreme enough, maybe we try to make our opinions more extreme in order to be heard, but they end up not being our opinions. So maybe we should think of Instead of the guaranteed uh, free speech, we, we were given free speech and we were also given the guarantee to be ignored. That, that's a very good point. Let me say one of the things that's disturbed me uh, in watching in Congress is most members of the House will never get a chance to be on a national news show. And look at those who do get a chance to be on a national news show. It's Michelle Bachman and Joe Wilson and Alan Grayson. The way to become a celebrity, and all of them, they travel around the country, and I'll guarantee you, they get people running up to them at airports saying, aren't you great, it's absolutely wonderful. And they're get, they get on TV all the time. How do they get on? By saying wild things. The more extreme things you say, the greater the lure that uh, is out there. And it's, it's creating a set of role models where you're going to get people saying things that they don't believe because that's the way you get ahead. So it exaggerates and amplifies the worst instincts uh, out there. Uh, and I'm not sure what we do about that. One of our great challenges, as network news has become a shadow of what it formerly was and is losing audience, uh, and uh, we don't have a public square anymore. One of our great problems in the country, let me say, is we used to share a common set of facts. And then we'd have uh, battles that could get really tough over solutions based on that common set of facts. We don't share a common set of facts anymore because people increasingly are cocooning into news media that tell them what they want to hear over and over again. And we live in a culture, frankly, where if you say something and repeat it enough times, it doesn't matter whether it's not true. You suffer no consequences for that. So we're filled with misconceptions. One of them that Larry mentioned, you know, there's been an email that's out there, I get it every other week, that says members of Congress get to keep all of their own pay for a lifetime if they serve for one term. Lou could tell you that's not true. Um, you get to keep the health care uh, forever, which is not true. They pay for their own health care in the same kind of exchange that's now built into this health care plan, by the way. And the health care plan says that uh, that members of Congress will be out there with everybody else doing that. And a lot of other things, stuff that's just not true gets repeated over and over again. And how you get past that and we recreate a public square is one of the great challenges for those of you who will be engaged in the media uh, to uh, grapple with. I think that's all the time we have. Thank you, Dr. Lincoln. Thank you.